come to expect when we see a satellite image of a tropical depression in the Caribbean that, sure enough, within seconds, it gets incorporated into a probabilistic model that shows on your television screen at home where the hurricane is going to land and who is going to affect, and then transmitting, literally in minutes, a personalized view of what you have to do in response to that public threat. Do we have anything like that in medicine? That takes the data, the research data, the clinical data, and creates a personalized probabilistic model that we can act on. 17 years ago, I was diagnosed with a small brain tumor, an acoustic neuroma. I asked colleagues around the world what was the right thing to do. The surgeons told me, cut. The interventional radiologist said, radiate. And then when I asked them to show me the data that would allow me to really do the head-to-head -head comparison, they only had the data supporting their perspective. There was no data. Our data was not being made to work for us. So we have to make our data work for us. And I'm here to tell you, things have changed a lot over that period of time. Let me tell you several stories, several short stories. We were worried in 2009 about a drug, Avandia, rosiglitazone, used to treat diabetes. We were worried that we were not using the right drug because it was causing more heart attacks than others. But it was really unclear whether that was true or not. So it was using a new system that we had developed, a new platform called I2B2, Informatics for Integrating Biology and the Bedside. We used a system to introspect into just a couple of the large hospitals in Boston. Alas, the, Boston, the hospitals that are today shut down. We used those data to introspect into our own patient populations. And we asked across all drugs, all across all our diabetic patients, who is causing more heart attacks in our patient populations. And what was amazing, in just a matter of weeks, we were able to answer, in fact, Avandia rosiglitazone was, in fact, causing a much higher heart attack rate than other drugs in the same class, like Actos, pioglitazone. The FDA actually cited our study that was done as part of a research protocol when they black boxed Avandia. So think about that, a research study that actually saves tens of thousands of patients just using the data, our data, and making it work for us. But the problem is, how do you translate that now into changed behavior during care, given the fact that our electronic health record systems are static, monolithic beasts, very up-to-date, if up-to-date is 1980s technology. And so what we've created is another platform called the SMART platform, where the S in SMART stands for substitute, substitutable, where we create these apps that get layered on top of the existing electronic health records so that we can actually provide decision support directly to the clinician so that they can see this public health threat around a particular drug, and they can see that in the context of the patient care, creating this uh, synthesis where we bring together bench side data, clinical data, and the bedside. As a result, of this approach with I2B2, we get insights that the healthcare system is only vaguely aware of. In this radar screen looking diagram, you see one patient, a woman, entering the healthcare system at the, at the middle of that slide. She's bouncing around emergency, emergency room visits, psychiatric visit, urinary tract infection, injury, dermatological uh, problems, gastrointestinal. I'd like you to think for one second, what is her diagnosis? The answer is domestic abuse. We were able to diagnose 
using 500,000 patients across all of Massachusetts from their electronic health record data, we were able to predict accurately domestic abuse on average two years before the healthcare system was aware of it, and up to six years. Now think, ask yourself the question, why are we not doing that now? Why are we not doing that ubiquitously? Because there are so many other such applications of the data that is staring us in the face if we only allowed our data to work for us. But things are changing. I2B2, smart, the platforms are being adopted. They're being adopted widely. And don't believe me, just go and ask the over 100 sites that have adopted I2B2 and SMART. And this is not, this free and open source software is free and open source, but it's free like a pony. You have to feed it, and you have to clean up after the poop. <laughs> so they are making major investments to take our software because they understand, nationally and internationally, that they have to make our data work for us. It's also helping us accelerate the translation of genomics into clinical science. Shown here is a diagram of the risk, the genetic risk of rheumatoid arthritis. On x-axis, you see multiple dots corresponding to genetic variants, or SNPs. On the y-axis, is the odds ratio, the risk of rheumatoid arthritis. The higher, the higher the risk. Shown with the blue dots are a previous study that took years and millions of dollars to find the risk for rheumatoid arthritis. We were able to re reproduce that study, shown with the red dots, using the computer to automatically read, using natural language processing, the clinical notes, to find the patients, to find the samples, to genotype, and then come up with very much the same risk. But the other studies that we reproduced had been focused on what? Caucasians. We were able to literally press a button and in a day get the same population except for those who are super underrepresented in genetic studies, namely underrepresented minorities, specifically African Americans and Hispanics. And we were able to show for those populations what was that genetic risk because we had that insight. Now, it's one thing to discover it, then how do we bring it back into the clinic? You will not be surprised, I think, to know that the greatest predictor of a doctor ordering a genetic test is the patient asking for the test. And so in order to really make doctors adopt genomic uh, decision-making, it has to be baked into the electronic health record. But guess what? None of the modern uh, vendors of electronic health records have genome-wide decision support. They don't even have genetic data. So again, using this smart platform, we've created a system that combines the clinical data, an app that combines the clinical data from the underlying electronic health record and the SNP data coming in from 23andMe to give the doctor a view of the patient that's clinically integrated with the genetic risk. The future is now. We have not only created a large open source international community, we've actually created a network of collaborators who are providing software, adding on to it. But we've created a ability to issue queries, distributed queries, that allow you to share clinical data under the appropriate uh, security, much in the same way as the MP3 stealing, I mean sharing networks of old, except legal, legally and with appropriate protections. And so now, for example, we're able to look at autism, which we think mostly of as a behavioral disease, and ask what are the other biological aspects of autism. So from this network that covers thousands of patients with autism, we're able to define the sub diseases, the autisms that are composed. And we were able to create a network that 
shows that there are some individuals, for example, who have a lot of seizures, but otherwise don't have any medical problems. Others who have a lot of uh, mood disorders, psychiatric disorders, schizophrenia, major depression. And yet others with autism who have a lot of infections and immunological disorders. These are sub-autisms that have biological correlates and that we're looking now at the genetic basis for that we would have not been aware of had we not made our data work for us. So, in our country, we must make our data work for, for us so that we can put a brain into our healthcare system. And so that this system can then become accountable so that it can perform medicine at the state of the art and that it can move the science forward. And the way we see that this has to be done first and foremost is by making our data work for us, bringing our research and our clinical care together, removing that artificial distinction, and using platforms such as I2B2 and SMART to actually um, enable that um, synthesis. So I'm now going to do something, perhaps just to keep myself awake or to keep you awake, that is a little bit hokey, but I think if I wanted you to take anything away from this talk, it is that we can now make our data work for us. But the main obstacle right now is the political will by the funders of healthcare to demand that we make our data work for us. So I hope you won't consider this too cute by half, but let's give it a shot. So remember, I'm a little hard of hearing because of that uh, tumor. So what I'd like you to do is to, is to say with me the following as loud as you can so that the funders hear us. Make our data count for us. Thank you very much.